So first of all, I'll just start off with one line and then as to why he matters. It was the greatest radical of a radical age, okay? And in the course of his life, he, he was the sort of, if you like, godfather of the American Revolution. It was, it was, right? I mean, no Thomas Paine, no American Revolution. A colonial rebellion, sure, no American Revolution. After that, he sustained the morale of the troops during the, the revolution and of the American people to whatever extent they were committed by way of a series of pamphlets called The Crisis. After the revolution, to make the long story short right now, he went back to Europe because he was born in England, as I'll explain in a moment. And he was involved in inspiring the English, the British struggle for democracy by way of a series of writings. Most importantly, he ends up in, in France during the French Revolution and authors Rights of Man, a two, a two, a two major pamphlets, two major pamphlets, which are an attack, the first one, an attack on British monarchy and a defense of the idea of a republic. And the second one in which he even goes beyond the idea of political democracy and he begins to propose what we know of as social democracy, okay? And later he, he writes in the course of the revolution, a pamphlet again of two parts called Age of Reason, the Age of Reason, which is, which is a critique of organized religion and the power of clergy. And finally, I mean, it wasn't the last thing he wrote, but the last major piece of pamphlet he wrote was titled Agrarian Justice, which really is the first sort of vision or idea and call for what we know of as social security. And keep in mind, this is all between 1776 and the 1790s, okay? So as we talk about pain, there's so much to cover. The revolution, the British struggles, the French Revolution, his ideas about not only religion, but even more radically when you think about the struggles for democratic socialism and social democracy, his original call for what we know of as social security or indeed the beginnings of social democracy. Now, as I said, he was born in England. He was born in 1737 in Southeast England, well, in Norfolk, which isn't fully Southeast, but it's the East, it's the southeastern region of England. And he was born into a fairly humble family. His father was an artisan, a craftsman, um, a skilled worker, we would call them today. And his father was a Quaker, okay? Now, Quakers were not, were not full citizens, full subjects, you might say, in Britain. Catholics, Jews, diverse Protestant groups, Quakers, these folks were tolerated as religious forces they really didn't sh have the same rights as people who were members of the Church of England. So, you know, I mean, th that, that matters in Thomas Paine's life. But even more curiously, um, Thomas Paine's father married an Anglican, okay? A woman, more of a middle-class uh, woman, the daughter, I believe, of a, of a lawyer. Um, she was just a few years older than, than his father. And they had, um, they had, two children, one of whom died in, I don't know if it was in childbirth or as an infant. So Thomas Paine basically grew up um, as, as an only child. And his parents didn't have a lot of money. And since there were no public schools as, as we think of them, they had to spend what monies they had and secure monies from members of the family. I believe there was an aunt who was willing to help out in, in covering the tuition. So Paine did go to school, which is, not usual necessarily for working class kids, obviously. And he remains in school till the age of 13. And it's notable that in school, he had certain subjects that he loved, absolutely loved science, okay? And he does eventually in, his, in the course of his life operate as something of an inventor, okay? And one of the reasons he goes back to Europe after the revolution is that he really wanted to build an iron bridge which was very, which was a sort of, would have been a real advance in the, in the new United States to connect all the states together, given rivers that flowed into the Atlantic through the colonies. And the fact that in winter, so many of these bridges would be destroyed by the ice that would form in those rivers. He wanted to build a bridge of iron. And the idea was that this would then connect this country. It would be a kind of way of connecting these states so that they wouldn't fall apart 
in comp in competition with each other because there's no guarantee they would remain in the United States. But he loved science as a as a boy. He also loved um, what we would think of as literature classes. He loved Shakespeare and Milton, the two great English writers, you know, William Shakespeare and John Milton. And he actually sort of fancied himself at many a time as something of a poet. His poetry left a lot to be desired. It's in various printed form. But what is interesting is that one of his more, more interesting songs had to do with the Liberty Tree, which was a real political statement of its day. So, I mean, it wasn't completely a waste of time that he tried his hand in that way. But at the age of 13, his parents had to pull him out of school because they just didn't have the money to keep him in school. Um, and what they did is they apprenticed him to his own father. So he would learn the craft that his father uh, made his livelihood. The craft, I haven't mentioned it yet, was corset making which was you know, the women's undergarments, the things that would hold them together with the proper, in quotes, shape. There's also called stay making. And that would come in handy, and I'll explain in a moment when we get to it. And he remained, he remained an apprentice to his father for several years. He didn't like it. It's a tough, very, very tough craft. And also it didn't pay a lot for his, fa his father didn't make a terribly good income. So something of a strain in the family that this would have to cover two, two, the two men, young men, the two young men and the father. But there, there were certain, there was a real value in the whole experience. One, because he did learn a craft. The second thing was, is that his father would relate to him the stories of the origins of the, of the what was called the Society of Friends, which is the more formal name for those whom we call Quakers. And in the 17th century, England had had its own revolution where they overthrew the king for, for a, cu a couple of decades, a few decades. And in the course of that, religion itself, because no longer did you have, the Anglican church no longer had a monopoly on religion. And those who had been involved in overthrowing the king were Puritans, that which really was a dissenting group against the, the Anglican church, the Church of England. And in the course of those years, many, uh, a Protestant group emerged, radical Protestant groups that preached radical ideas and um, the Quakers were among them. And so his father would relate the stories of the English Revolution. His father had not been alive during the revolution at all, but it was the case that this was something that any good, any good Quaker, any, any good friend, capital F friend, would know. So Payne, as a boy, is already hearing stories of dissent and rebellion and revolution. And that surely played into his own view of the world. The, at the same time, his mother, as a, who was an Anglican, was insistent that he learn the Bible, literally learn the Bible by heart in many ways. So he had this sort of Quaker ideas about self, you know, how would you put it, kind of dissent, and also that each person, you know, in some ways has a light within them. And then he also learns this sort of more hierarchical version of, of the Christian faith in, of Anglicanism. And in part, that played into uh, to his literary abilities later that he would learn the Bible. But the other thing was the stress between the father and his, his father and his mother over questions of religion must surely have also impressed upon Payne the importance of seeing beyond these, these conflicts of religion and also the imperative of freedom of religion and free thinking. So anyhow, in around the time Payne reached, I think it would have been like at age of 19, he runs away. He just says he's had enough. And he runs away and he signs up to serve on board a privateer. And a privateer is a ship, a private ship that's been licensed by the crown to go out and attack enemy shipping. So you can either call it a kind of sort of, it's like a, a, an official piracy, a legalized piracy in some ways. And what happens then is that the, if, if they win the fight against the, 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 the other ship, they lay claim to the ship and its cargo. And when it's brought to an English port, the, the value of it is divided up between the captain and the crew, and then the, the crown keeps the ship itself. And he spends sort of sounds like an early this sort of sorry to interrupt, but this sort of sounds like an early version of like private military or like, like well, military I mean, oh, contract. Well, they weren't mercenaries. It was act to be a privateer still had an, a, an element, a real element of patriotism. 
so for example, it, we don't know, I mean, to what extent it was, it would have been a mix of patriotism and a desire for adventure for a young man or a boy. And last but not least, doing so and putting money in your pocket. If you lived, because you could easily have been killed, I mean, but Payne lived. And on board ship, he no doubt was a, of real value because in the, the art of stay making, corset making, equipped him to also be a mender of sails on the, on the, on the ship. He also probably learned a great deal about, about solidarity of the crew. He also would have learned a great deal or at least been afforded a real opportunity to look up at the heavens and his scientific mind would have been wondering about the nature of the universe. And also his, his mixed religious background would have led him to probably ask many a question about the nature of, of life and, and the existence of God, okay? So there's all these possibilities. Well, when he leaves ship and he does so after a year with money in his pocket and his life still completely in his, in his control, he goes to London, which at that time was the major city of the world, had a population I think, of 600,000. And he joins the artisan community of London, which is a really interesting group of, you know, of diverse skilled men and their families. Um, that had a tradition, a cultural tradition among these artisans of autodidacticism, self-education, which meant not only did they read a lot to learn about the world and also the, the, the questions of science that were emerging, but also they would organize lectures among them. They would actually literally come together at a tavern or a coffee shop in the evening and chip in monies to pay for a lecture. Might it be on geography, it might be on astronomy, it might be on metals, whatever it might be. The point was, it was a real self-education process. And it would have also raised a lot of questions again about politics probably in an indirect way, okay? The skilled artisans were not, if you, you know, many of them were far better off than the average working man, but it was still the case that in England, there was no democracy to speak of. Maybe one out of every 20 men could have the right to vote because you had to have a certain income or a certain amount of property or pay a certain amount of tax to be entitled to vote. And, and you couldn't do that unless you were a member of the Church of England. And a lot of the artisans were not necessarily Anglicans. They might've been the newly emergent Methodist group, maybe some Baptists, you know, diverse possibilities. So after about a year, Payne has sort of gone, really had a, a good experience in London, a year on board ship, a year in London, but he's running out of money. And the only skill he knows is corset making. So he leaves London, moves out to what would today perhaps be called a suburb, but he lives out of London to a, a, to a, you know, a town and village outside of London and sets himself up in a business as a, as a stay maker. And he there meets his first the first love of his life, which tragically ended up in her death in childbirth. So, which is a real, I mean, his business was tough to begin with, and then he's shattered by the tragedy of losing his wife and infant child. And the question for him now is, what is he gonna do? Okay, what is he gonna do? 